good. Hello, good evening. Um, welcome. <laughs> I shouldn't say welcome, it's nearly the end of the day. Um, my name is Chris Jenkins. Um, I put this on last night for Halloween. I thought I'd get a bit more reuse out of it and use my profile pic today. Um, I appreciate I am competing with a free bar upstairs. So thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Kafka and what it's like and what it's like to build things with it. Um, and I think it's an interesting thing to build with because it's, it's a database, but it's kind of not. Um, it, it looks a lot like a database to a certain point of view, right? Because when you, you can store data in it permanently, you can query it out. So it's a database. But it's not really like a relational database like uh, Postgres or SQL Server or what you might be used to. Um, it also behaves a bit like a queue. You can put things on it and find out what new things have arrived and process them. So it's kind of like a queuing system, but it's not because it's persistent and it behaves a lot more like a database. It kind of sits in between the two. It also behaves a bit like a really big list of stuff if there are any Lisp programmers in the room, you'll know that you can do almost anything with a big list of stuff. So that's a good thing. But I, when I first approached Kafka, I was trying to get my head around what it really is. Uh, is it a state machine? Yes, it is a bit like a state machine too. But the way I think about it, the way that kind of clicked with me finally, was to look at the way most modern databases do replication. The way they tend to do replication these days is there's a primary database, and every time there's an insert or an update or a delete or a create table or something, first thing they do is they write it into a append-only log file. And um, you just write each statement to a log file that only ever grows. And then you ship that log file between uh, the secondary nodes. And the secondary node applies each statement and eventually gets to the same logical state as the primary. This works really well. An append-only log file is a really nice data structure because it's easy to copy around at your leisure. You can, um, you can just take the newest bits, ship those across. You know that you'll never have to update anything you've shipped because it never changes, it only grows. So your job as a replication system is to just make sure whatever's new gets copied and you're pretty much done. And we know from using systems like this that as long as you have a complete log of everything shipped around to all the secondaries, then you can kind of build this state machine that applies each statement in turn and rebuilds an entire database just from a log of what happened. This works actually really well. You can think of each secondary node as just a state machine, a very nice state machine, very fancy state machine. I'm not saying anything against SQL servers, but ultimately, they're a state machine on replication logs, is a way to think about it. And that's actually a lot how, like Kafka works, you take facts that have occurred in your domain, you append them to a log that only ever grows, and you kind of, you, as you would expect, that log has the same, prop uh, the same uh, properties. It's easy to replicate among different nodes. It's easy to know what the latest data is. And then we just build up this state machine that turns it back into something more like a database. Or does it? Do we need as complex a state machine as that to get something useful out of it? Um, do, if, if we actually modeled our system as starting with the replication log and building up, would we, would we build a complex SQL-like state machine? Would we build simpler state machines? Would we do away with them entirely and just process individual events? These are very abstract questions, and if you learn anything the way like I learn, it's too abstract to kind of get your head around without actually getting your hands dirty and building something. So that's what I did um, a long time ago. Um, I tr thought I would build myself a thing which got the ideas of Kafka under my fingernails, right? And I thought, what can I build? I could build a Java pet store. That'd be very exciting. The world needs one of those. 
Um, no. Uh, to-do list manager, if you program in JavaScript, you're as sick of to-do list managers as Java people are of Java pet stores. Um, I could do order processing, which is a really common example in Kafka. I just felt that was a bit done. So I, turn, I went old school. I uh, went back to my roots as a programmer, and I tried building a text adventure. Now, I've given this talk one before and I once before, and I realize some people are too young to remember what a text adventure is. So uh, I apologize for being so old that I do quite fondly. Um, let, me, let me give you a quick recap for history's sake. These, they were games that were hugely popular in the, um, I want to say, 80s, maybe a bit into the 90s. They survive today. You can find the same kind of game in narrative adventure games, right? Where there's lots of text, you, you make some choices along the way, you do some things, and the story evolves by, you, by the choices you make and the places you go to make those choices. Before a game like this, when things are a bit more primitive, we have things like uh, The Secret of Monkey Island, which is... I don't want to say it's more primitive, because to me this represents the pinnacle of gaming, in a way. But uh, yeah, these, these were partly graphical, but mostly puzzle-solving games, dialogue-heavy, because the writing was where most of the fun was. Before that, things got even more primitive with games like this, which were almost entirely text, maybe the old graphic or two. I'm going to go even more primitive than that and just do text. So let me give you a demo of what I built, and then we're going to shake down how it actually works. So, here we go. Uh, that needs to be a bit bigger. So, uh, I hope you like my retro CSS styling here. Um, I can send commands at a prompt. So, uh, unknown commands, try asking for help. Okay, I'll try asking for help. Available commands are, look, go north, go south, go west, go east, pick up an item, use an item, inventory, what items have I got, and the help we've just seen. So let's start with look. You're standing on stage at DevOps. In the middle of the room stands a giant computer spitting out data. The data looks important, but you don't know why. You can see data and a lanyard. Let's try going west. You enter the toilets. There's nothing to do here, at least nothing I want to describe. OK, let's go back the way we came. Go east. I think um, the title of the talk is Pick Up Data. That was a little clue, so I'm going to pick up some data. You pick up data. Let's pick up the lanyard while we're here. You pick up lanyard. What am I holding? Inventory. Your knapsack contains data and a lanyard, as you'd expect. OK. I may have played through this game once before, so I know that the next step is to go north. <laughs> You're standing in the main hallway. It is bustling with life and coffee. <laughs> Let's try using um, my cat. Let's use the cat. You do not have that item to use. Of course I don't. Let's use the data. You cannot use that item here. Disappointing. OK, can I use the lanyard? You wave your lanyard in the air like a fool. Someone in the distance shouts, hey, that looks like fun. And pretty soon, you've started a flash mob of lanyard wavers. You dance for hours, and the party subsides. And as the mob leaves, one dancer drops his conference t-shirt. You pick it up. And now if we just check the inventory one more time, we should find we no longer have a lanyard, but we do have a t-shirt. And that's how the game is played. You find out what to use where, and gradually the, th the story evolves. That's as far as I'm going to go with the demo. But you get the sense of um, how it's played. So how's it built? I have a warning here. There is code in this, and I appreciate the hour of the day and the bar that was open before you very kindly decided to join me. Don't get too hung up on the code. Um, the shape of it is more important, you know? Uh, as they say, don't fear the code. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings annihilation. I can see who's watched the film. <laughs> um, that guy's literally falling into lines of code. I quite like that. 
So how is this built? There is a dumb client on the front end that just talks over a WebSocket. And it looks like this. The user's typing at a prompt. And we send that, that string, that raw string, over a WebSocket to a web server. And the web server just very dumbly writes it to one of these logs of events, called, which I've called commands. And then the commands somehow get processed, and we do stuff with them. And this process, whatever it does, is going to spit new responses onto another log called responses. And the web server is watching that for, your, for the responses that are aimed for, for your user, and it just spits them out. So the web server portion of this is incredibly dumb. Listen for stuff, write it to what's called a topic, this replication log, and then watch for responses that affect my user and spit them back. And when I wrote this, I pretty much wrote all the code for the web server and then just left it running. And in a separate process, this do stuff is a separate Java process that, as it changes, the dumbness of the web server is a feature. That doesn't change. It just stays up and running. So before we get too deep into this, let's look at the code that builds that out. So we've got two communication streams. And yes, this is looking a little bit like CQRS, if you're thinking that. Um, create a replace stream called commands. I've given it a user ID which in reality I'm going to make a UUID, and a command, which is just a plain string at this stage. And then the response is almost identical. I've just added um, a source field, because for debugging, it's nice to know which process or which sub-process or which Java class generated that particular response. It's a nicety for debugging. So our job becomes really to decide how do we do stuff with this infinite list of um, strings. How do we turn that one into this one? Start simple. The simplest possible do stuff we can do is echo, right? So uh, it's almost the hello world of, um, of socket servers. In code, this looks like this. I'm using Kafka streams here which is a Java and Scala library, which just makes it nice for processing um, streams of events coming through. Uh, if you're used to streams in Java or um, a similar language, if you went to the Haskell talk and thought, oh, I like processing infinite lists of things, it will, it, all this stuff looks, will look familiar. So I start with a stream building object, and I, take, I build this stream based on my um, topic called commands. And then there's some serialization stuff, which by and large in this talk, I'm going to try and leave out. Um, I'll give you the source code if you want it. But it kind of confuses the slides. So essentially, I'm building this stream. Just give me every command that's coming in, and I will worry about it somehow. And now we can process it. We can say, take that stream of commands and run a function over every value, over every piece of data. Um, my response is simply, I'm going to say this response came from the echo process, and I'm just going to format a string called echo, and send it to my responses thing. And now my dumb web server is going to watch um, for responses that were generated with the same key. Right? Incidentally, I didn't say, if you have any questions, uh, please interrupt. I'm quite happy to answer questions. So, that's the general pattern of things. How do we turn this into an actual game? The first thing we need, the first building block for this, is a way of discerning different, part, different commands and how we want to spread them out for different kinds of processing. So our first building block here is something that allows us to split streams. Um, and it, Semantically, it looks a bit like an if, else, if, else statement, right? We've got these things coming in. We can test them to see if this particular stream, this particular processor finds them interesting. If it does, it will process them. Otherwise, it's going to leave someone else to worry about it all the way down the chain. You get bonus points in the job interview if you call this the chain of responsibility pattern. You get your little enterprise badge. 
So let's look at this in code. We take this stream called the command stream, which we had from our echo definition, and we split it. And that gives us a branch stream on which we can start to define branches. Our first branch, and the way branches look, is you get the key and the value. Every, each uh, record in the stream has a key, which is our user ID, and the value, which is the string. And you have to return a Boolean, right? So it's just a predicate on the key and value. And then there are a few different ways you can process it, but the basic one is I'll give you a function that takes that stream and does stuff with it. So in our case, this is going to look like I'll give you a user ID and a command. You tell me if you're interested in the command. If you are, you deal with the command. Okay. So our first command, the easiest one to implement, is help. And we'll just dumbly say, if the command string is the exact string help, then we are interested in processing it here in this piece of code. And the way we'll process it is just to build up that nice string of what commands you can run and spit it out as a response value to the responses list. Right? Pretty straightforward. Not actually wildly different from the echo. The nice thing about splitting um, a stream into branches is you get a f almost free a default handler, a fallback handler. So you can ensure that you've processed everything because anything we haven't processed is going to go to the default branch, which has no predicate because it's got to handle everything that makes it to this piece of code. And we're just going to say unknown command and spit the command back to the user and send that as a response. So now our job becomes, to build the game, we have to stick everything above unknown command but below help, and we're away. How do we do that? Well, unsurprisingly, the first step is to think about parsing those commands. Right? So let's start with um, one kind of parser. We'll start with the movement commands. And we'll just say the valid commands are go north, go south, go east, go west. And our predicate is, are they in that list of magic strings for movement? Right? If they are, well, we could process them here, but actually I'm going to send them off to a separate log of dedicated to movement commands. I could process it in line. The advantage of moving it to another stream excuse me, is it makes it easy to have a completely separate, perhaps Java, perhaps Go, any language process dealing with that independently. So it kind of gets outside the scope of this talk because we're talking about scaling up to multiple nodes and multiple processes. But it's, it's neat to say, OK, those are mine. I'm going to process them over here. So that's why I've done that. Another way we could do this, a slightly more intelligent parser, is we could build a parsing class that tries to take, rather than parsing that raw string, tries to enrich it with a more structured thing, which I've called an inventory command value. Right. So we'll look at the string, we'll do some kind of parsing on it, fairly dumb in this case, for illustration purposes, and we'll turn it into a richer data type at this point, and then we'll send that richer data type onto its own string. So we've got movement commands, which are just the string. We've got inventory commands, which are a richer object. And that makes our initial processing look like this. We have the go north, go south stuff, go to movement commands. We have the pick up and use stuff going into inventory commands. Everything else will process directly. So let's look at movement commands first. How do you deal with movement in a game like this? Well, the first thing you need to do is know where someone is. Ideally, what we want to do is take all those movement commands and roll it up into some kind of table of which user is where, right? This is like, this is our first state machine we've started to build back up into a database-like thing. How do you do that? Not too hard. Take the stream of movement commands, look at each one, and give me a position delta, right? So go north is an x movement of zero and a y movement of positive one. Couldn't remember which way around had done the coordinate system. Very important. Um, and we shouldn't need this default null case, but I've allowed for it, right? And then, so this is going to turn our stream of commands into a stream of deltas. 
We just need to roll that up to get the absolute position through the lifetime of the game, which we can do like this, group by key, group by, with the user ID as the key. So we're dealing with each individual user, and then we can reduce it by just, you can take any two positions, add them together, and get a final position, right? Any functional programmers in the room? Not a one? Okay, in case anyone's watching at home online, I'm going to say monoid and leave it at that, because I'm a bit of a category theory geek. I like Haskell a lot. So for the people in the audience who like that too, you get that. <laughs> um, so that gives us a table. Fairly straightforward. It's a table of every user and where they are in the world. Ends up looking like this. The interesting thing about tables in Kafka is they behave a lot like um, a database table that you're probably used to, but they're also live. They have this kind of leading edge of what the latest changes are. So we can turn that table of positions into a new stream saying, this user has just updated their position to minus one, two. So it's a table. It's almost a static table, but it's also live with the latest changes, which again can behave like a stream. So if we want to tell the user where they've moved to, we can just take this user position table, turn it back into a stream, and process that as a series of movement status commands. Right. So we can move around in the game. It's not terribly useful because we can't actually see anything yet. We're just a position moving around through space. So the next thing we need to worry about is locations. Right. How do we do locations? For this, we need another table, which is uh, another stream, sorry, which is just um, x and y of the place we're trying to describe on the map, a description, and which objects you can find there. Yeah? Um, and then there's some static data in SQL, pretty straightforward. Now, we've got a table of the user's position, and we ought to be able to put build up a table of positions and the description stuff. We'd like to join those two things together to get a kind of richer position, a position that includes this information of where you are. How does that look in code? First thing we do is take that location data stream and build it into a table. I'm using a global table in there. I'm not going to go into the differences between a regular table and a global table, except to say it's to do with partitioning across multiple nodes. Feel free to ask a question if you want more detail. But uh, so then, once we've got this user position table, which we're turning into a stream of updates, we can join to the location table. And this code says, on the location data table, how do you get, oh, sorry, on the user position table, tell me how to get the key of the thing you're joining to. So it's just the position. And then what do you want to do once you've got the position and the location data? Well, I'm going to join them into this kind of hybrid object, this join object. With that in place, we can actually start to send more interesting information back to the user. So they, they may have fallen off the map. We need to check the location data is not null. If it is, we send them a message saying, get back the way you came. Otherwise, we can spit out that um, text string that you saw. Um, yeah. This seems interesting enough to reuse. So the next step is to turn that back into a table. Streams turning into tables, tables turning into streams. We're going to set up this table, which we can always look to see for a given user. Don't just tell me where they are. Tell me about where they are. Tell me the location description, right? So it just combines those two in a handy lookup table. Where does that put us? We have live streaming data, streaming in from a client, streaming back out to the world. We can fan it out for different processing, um, hand it off to other processes if we want, certainly to different Java classes processing it. We have a concept of standing data, right? We've turned a stream into a standing data table of locations. We have stateful tables, just like you would expect in a relational database. But those stateful tables are themselves live sources of streaming information. And we have joins. 
we're nearly there. We've nearly built a game. We just need to bite off that chewy part of how do you use items, right? So we need to be able to pick things up. We need to see what you've picked up, and we need to be able to use them. And if we've got those last three pieces, we should have a game built. And we can step back and say, was this a good idea? Which I think is important in life sometimes, to step back and ask if what you've done is a good idea. Hopefully the answer is yes. I'm excited to find out, aren't you? <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is um, so when somebody says, pick, let's deal with this one first, picking things up. When somebody sends a pick up item command, we're going to uh, join it with this table we just defined. And either the item they want to pick up is available, so we can do something with that, or it isn't. And we can send the user a message, which we saw earlier, saying, you can't pick that up. Right? So as code, that looks like this. Take that stream of inventory commands. Just look at the ones we deal with picking stuff up. Join it to the user location, which we defined earlier. And check if the item they're asking for is in the locations list of available objects. And we could process it straight away, but again, I'm just going to defer it. I'm just going to say, take just the logic of figuring out if it's available and return this um, intermediate object called a pickup, which is the thing you want and whether or not it's available. With that, we can then split the inventory requests and say, OK, the ones where it is available, send uh, an item held thing off to a new stream called inventory. So we'll have this permanent record of everything they managed to pick up. And if it isn't available, then the default branch is complain back to the user. There's one more thing we need to do for this to work is when you pick something up, you want some feedback that you picked it up. So we're going to watch this inventory stream for every successful pickup. And we're going to stream that back to the user's responses, right? Again, this is, I hope you're seeing this is all built out of stuff comes in, I look at it, I make some decisions, I send some stuff out. So we can pick stuff up. How do we check what we've picked up? Well, unsurprisingly, we're going to look at this stream of um, inventory items. What does the user currently hold? Build a new stream from the stream of inventory messages that we just created. Group that by the user ID. Group that by the key. And a bit like the reduce we did earlier, this is a fold. Again, if you're happy with that terminology, start with an empty array list, add each item as you see it, and that should build you a table of each user and what they're currently holding. Right? And then um, when we look at this inventory command stream, and there's a command saying, what's my inventory, which you saw me type earlier. We can join that to this table of user and things they hold and send those messages back. Yeah. Sometimes they won't ha hold anything, so it's a left join, and you may get an um, empty list of items. Last thing, last thing before we've got a game is the ability to use items, and it's the last and juiciest part of the code. So I hope you're still with me at, what is it, quarter to seven. It's only a Monday. It's not a Friday. So I'm assuming you mostly are. <laughs> um, how do you use items? Right. Let's start with a, um, a rules table. Let's build one of those up. So we'll create a stream of rules that say, uh, what's the item we've got a rule for? Where are you? X, Y position. Where do you have to be to use it? And when you use it, what description do we send to the user? And what do they get in return for using it? We could have a more complex system of rules, but we haven't. Every time you use something, you get something back in this game. So an example of that is if you use the drink at position 5.8, you get that message, and you get an empty glass, which you can continue your adventure with. How do we build that? up and use it. First thing, we've already seen this. You build a table that rolls up the item rules. 
And now we've got a table of uh, the key is the item name, and the, the value is the rest of the data. So we can deal with using items if we look for use item commands, join it with what the user's got, join it with where they are to check they're in the right place to use it, and join it to the item rules, three joins, and we should have everything we need to build the last bit of the game. Let's see that in code. Almost there. One last bit of code. Promise. So take the stream of inventory commands and look for use commands. Join it to the knapsack table. And anyone like tuples? I've just used an intermediate pair object here. Um, there are a few intermediate objects, and when we get to the end, I'm going to do something more official. So join. Um, the request to pick something up with what that user is holding. Join that to their location, because we need to know if they're in the right place to use it. And then join that to um, the rules for the item they're trying to use. And you end up with this composite object that says all those things in a nice, big, meaty value, which we can then process. We get a stream of these use item join types. Um, it, the inventory command, the location, the knapsack, and the rules. Let's process that. Final straight, we're almost there. Split that stream of things. And first question is, is the item available in that location? So we just need to look in, um, sorry, is the item available in the knapsack? So we look in the knapsack and see if the item they're trying to use is there. And if it's not, we'll process it straight away by saying, you don't have that item to use. Next check, are they in the right place? Is there an item rule? Uh, did, we, did we find a rule for the item they're trying to use? And if we did, does it have the same x value and the same y value as where they're standing? And if, any of, and if that fails, then tell them they can't use the item here. Might be able to use it elsewhere, but here is not the place for that item to be used. Then, last thing, and there are a few niceties on this slide, so I'll slow down a bit. The default branch says you can use this item. We've checked all the failure conditions. We're into the success condition. And we're going to say, OK, firstly, let's send the description from that rule back to the user. Secondly, let's have this um, you're no longer holding it message sent to the inventory for the thing you've used up. And another, you are now holding it message for the thing you've acquired, right? The interesting thing that I hadn't shown on previous slides here is firstly, you can take this stream and process it in two ways at once. That's fine. You're just taking a value and dealing with it in two ways instead of one. That's fine. Also, this stream can return more than one thing to be sent to the inventory, which is also fine. You can, send, you can take in a stream of things and send zero or more things on. That does it. That's pretty much all the code you need to write this game. We can begin to step back and see if it was worth it. <laughs> so in summary, this is kind of what it looks like, right? You've got a commands coming in and responses going out. You've got a few different um, streams of data that you spread out for processing. You've got a few standing data tables. That's how it's done. <sighs> so to step back, as I did when I finished writing it, trying to teach myself Kafka in the early days, what's it like? What's it like to write applications with this kind of database? And is this actually a useful learning tool? Well, I say it is, because this does look like a toy until you actually stop thinking about the specific domain of the game and start thinking about what's going on in it. If you look at the inventory management stuff with a business hat on, it looks exactly like processing a shopping basket. The user adds stuff to their shopping basket, takes it out. Eventually, they try and do something with the contents of that shopping basket. 
if you look at the item rules for how items can be used, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see that as a workflow system. When you're in a certain state, then you can try and transition to the next state, and you build out um, workflow engines with the same shape of pattern. You can look at this enrichment of a user's position stream and adding in extra data. So we've got this standing data table of more interesting facts about that position. You can look at that as a kind of stream enrichment thing that you might get in warehousing or shipping, order processing, right? Where parcels travel around the world and you need to know both where it is and extra data about it. All business concerns with the shame, same shape as this toy. Um, and you can also, I think this is the most obvious one, you could look at the tracking of the location that the user moves around and say, well, that's the bare bones of an analytics system, right? And we can start to think about the user's paths around the system, rolling up that into something even richer. So, I don't think it's a toy. What was it like to program? Well, by and large, it was just a matter of taking events coming in, deciding what to do with them, maybe transforming them along the way, and spitting events out. Data in, decision, data out. And I think it's, it's unfamiliar, but it's quite nice. It's, if you've used Java Streams, maybe it's not even so unfamiliar as a way of thinking about the world. And if I can step back and take an even larger look at the bigger picture. Where I think Kafka fits in is um, actually really addressing a larger um, idea in programming. That there's this question in programming, how, perennial question, how do we manage complexity? How do we manage the state of our system? And there are a couple of big answers. There's the um, object-oriented answer, which is to say you split state into islands of separate responsibility, and the trick to programming is to getting these islands to communicate with each other. Or you can take perhaps a more functional approach, and you can say, well, the, the trick to managing state is to eliminate it as far as you can and just have bunches of facts and transformations on those facts which yield new facts and new facts until you spit out the facts you want at the end. Um, and without saying that one or other is better, I think, try not to say that because I am admittedly a bit biased, I, I, I think the industry has spent a lot of time with the let's manage complexity as islands of state paradigm and is getting increasingly interested in let's manage it as facts and transformation on facts. If you, you can see that playing out in programming languages, right? It, in the difference between object orientation and functional programming. You also see it play out in things like front end programming, right? Where we've gone from, I will write my jQuery that manipulates this bit of the page and someone else manipulates that bit of the page and let's hope they don't need to talk together too much because that can get complicated. Versus something like React or Elm where you see the world as stuff happens, I'm going to transform the global state and then find a way to render that fact out to the screen. You see it happen in DevOps where instead of having individual machines handcrafted and hand curated, hand tended almost like a, like a zookeeper feeding animals, instead you have this approach where I'm just going to specify a series of facts about my machine and someone else, preferably a computer, will then apply that series of facts to my cluster of machines to bring it up to date with the state I want. Um, and I think the thing I find interesting about Kafka is taking that same concept and applying it to databases where you stop thinking of the world in terms of mutable, updatable tables and start to see it as a series of facts you transform. I think it's a very interesting programming model. I'm excited about where it's going and I hope I've whet your appetite for at least trying it out um, and experimenting with that way of seeing in the world in the database domain or whatever domain you work in. 
And with that, I will say thank you very much. Um, I gladly take questions. If you want to get your hands dirty, I'm doing a coding workshop upstairs tomorrow afternoon at 2.45. Please join me for that. If you do or if you don't, check out the source code there. If you come along to the workshop, please um, at least do Docker Compose up on this before you come along to save us half an hour of network bandwidth. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, take a photo of it if you. If I hope you join me tomorrow, and um, I'm there on Twitter. And yeah, I'll happily take any questions you have. Otherwise, I will leave you to beer o'clock. Thank you.